Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Thomas Whittle Whittlesborg asks, what's your problem? Today, he'll show us how to solve that problem. Thomas, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Bill, for inviting me. Thomas, you've written a fantastic book. I told you I loved it from the minute I picked it up. It's entitled, What's Your Problem? And in the beginning, you say or ask us, are we solving the right problem? That's, I, it certainly came as a shock to me. I think always I'm thinking I'm solving the right problem. But uh, how often are we going in the wrong direction? <laughs> Uh, surprisingly often. Uh, I did a survey of uh, more than 100 uh, companies and 85% of them said this is a mistake we often make. Uh, if you ask uh, people who are professional problem solvers, they will tell you that for every five problems, uh, three or even four of them actually needs to be rethought on some level for every four, uh, five problems that they run into from somebody else, like when trying to solve other people's problems. So this is a big problem for us. Like we, we, <laughs> we, we just, we jump into solution mode without making sure we're solving the right problems. And from a business standpoint, aside from our own personal life, is there any even estimate of how much money we probably waste going in the wrong direction? I like to uh, turn that around and just like make people think of it themselves. So when, when you think of your own workplace or whatever, how much are you wasting or spending there? Uh, one interesting data point that I really thought about, uh, and I'm, I'm answering it about in a way that's not about money, is actually from the medical world where that's probably the place where we have studied uh, you know, people's ability to diagnose problems the most. And in that world, for basically 15% of, uh, of all the uh, doctor visits go wrong in the sense that you, you walk in and in one out of seven times, you are getting the wrong diagnosis up front. Now, that's a world where we have studied, uh, you know, diagnosis of problems for years. It's a profession. And still we, we get it wrong with, with predictable consequences. You don't want to get the wrong diagnosis from your doctor. So, so this is about more than just money, I think. And now you really have me interested because, as you say, we don't want the wrong diagnosis. And one out of seven is a scary number. You know? Now, you talk about reframing. And uh, can you tell us, first of all, what do you mean by reframing a problem? I think the, the best way to explain it that is actually through an example uh, that I call the slow elevator problem. Uh, and for that, imagine that you are the owner of an office building and that your tenants are complaining about uh, the, the elevator, that it's, it's slow. Now, if you take that framing of the problem for granted, you're going to start getting creative around how do we make an elevator faster? You know, can we upgrade the motor or do we have to go out and, and buy a new elevator? Reframing the problem is about saying, wait a second, instead of thinking about solutions, is there another way to look at the problem itself? Is there another way of thinking about what's going on? And the classic example here, of course, well, what do building managers do when they are receive complaints about an elevator? There's something they very often try, which is to put up a mirror next to the elevator. Because what happens is people, go, you know, they're busy, they look up, they see a mirror, they see their own beautiful visage, and they fall in love and forget time. That's not a solution that makes the elevator faster. That is a solution to a different problem, namely that the weight uh, is getting noticed and that it's annoying people. That's now, that amazed me because when I, I saw that, I said that would probably be the last solution if you gave me hundreds of thousands that I would pick to say the mirror. But I guess that's the essence of what you're telling us about. Am I correct? Exactly. It, it's very often when, when you stop yourself from jumping into solution mode and instead try to think creatively about the problem itself, you'll discover that either you're solving the wrong problem or that there's a smarter problem to solve. Sure, you could go out and buy a new elevator and that might fix it, but it's much less expensive to put up a mirror. Uh, so that, that's the core of it. Now, when you reframe a problem, does that change the solutions you go into or do we just go off maybe to use a directional example, like 1% to the left or to the right, or does that open up a whole new world? I think it can do both. Sometimes it's just a small tweak that's necessary. 
other times you'll find that you can go off in, in a completely different direction. The, the mirror example, um, I mean, that can seem a little superficial to some people going like, wait, does that really solve the problem? And the answer is, yes, it does. If the problem you're solving is uh, reducing the, the, the feeling of waiting. Whereas let's say people are wrong. Uh, they're, they're, they're late for an important meeting. In that case, uh, you might go in and say, well, is the elevator slow at specific times? Is it because everybody's going to lunch at 12 o'clock? And that's where the, the peak demand is. So maybe we could spread out the lunch breaks. So that you, you can basically, almost for any problem, you can find lots of different angles of attack on it. And, and that's, that's good news because typically for that, whatever problems your listeners have right now, there's probably more than one way to solve them, and reframing can help you find that. When you bring this up to a business, how are you greeted? Is it like, oh, this is too simple. We want something more complicated that <laughs> has uh, 38 steps? Uh, you know, because sometimes simple solutions are just looked at. They're too simple. It can't be the right way. How, how do business people treat you? I, <laughs> yeah, I ask them how they have been faring with their 38-step frameworks uh, because <laughs> they, they, they can work wonderfully well in a dedicated workshop. Uh, but the second you are off into the, the wild of the everyday work life, I mean, it's Wednesday afternoon, uh, you have a problem and you have very limited time. You don't have the time to pull out a book or whatever. Like, what do you remember? You remember the simple stuff. What gets done? The simple stuff. So... I've, I've basically brought it down to kind of a three-step essence uh, that you can remember without having a book handy. Now, Thomas, what, one of the things, I don't know why, I seem to find that if I have a personal problem uh, that I'm working on, I will either get an idea in the shower or when I'm walking, and I do a lot of walking around the neighborhood. Am I an oddball, an outlier, or is there something about these two places, or are there other places that other people uh, get inspiration or ideas? You're, you're an example uh, of uh, what's called incubation in the research literature. This is something that goes back to 1926 when the first research uh, Graham Wallace goes in and, and figures out, well, what does creativity look like? Typically, there's some kind of phase involved where you're doing something else and your, your subconscious mind is kind of mulling over the problem. For me, it's a shower as well and walking in a forest. Uh, th those, <laughs> those two things will reliably kind of kickstart some new thinking. And I noticed something in your book. You, you actually say sometimes to solve a hard problem, you have to stop looking for solutions, which sounds counterintuitive, but does that just put the mind at rest or open up new boxes for us? It, it, that's exactly what it does. It, there, there's something we, we're so primed to drive towards solving a problem. Like everybody jumps into solution mode and it's weird, but like that act of stepping back from it, of deliberately not working on the solution can actually help you. And I think, you know, what you're talking about is one way of doing it, uh, you know, taking a walk or taking a shower or whatever. Um, reframing is almost a more active way of doing it, but you know, okay, if I'm not jumping into solution, solutions, what am I doing instead? Well, you're trying to brainstorm on different ways of looking at the problem because it's not always we have time to, you know, go, go for a long walk in the woods uh, or, or, or take a shower in the middle of the workday. That's not always viable either. Now, Thomas, you, you deal obviously with a lot of very intelligent people. You're dealing with business people, et cetera, and who know the area of work that they have, whether it's manufacturing or medicine, et cetera. Um, but you say they keep solving the wrong problem. Do you actually see a solution to a problem that someone has come up with? And, and I guess they're um, at least adequately happy with it. And yet you can tell it's the wrong solution or do you come to them and say, you know, you might want to try X, Y, and Z instead of ABC? It's, I think people recognize it once I bring it up. Like once I start that discussion, uh, I do a lot of executive education uh, type stuff. Once I start the discussion, people realize that that's what they have been doing. So I, uh, I have actually found that there's, there's a lot of openness to it in uh, at least when people stop and think. It's more in the moment that it can sometimes be difficult when, when you're so pressed towards jumping into action. And there it can really help just saying, wait a second, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? And is that necessarily the right problem we're looking at? Thomas, we'd just like to remind our audience, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success. 
on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, and today we're talking to Thomas Whittle- Whittlesburg. He is the author of What's Your Problem? And Thomas, I'm going to spell your last name because if someone's looking for the book, it may not, the way I'm pronouncing it, it may not be exactly the way they would look for or spell it. And your last name is spelled W-E-D-E-L-L hyphen W-E-D-E-L-L S-B-O-R-G. And we'll give that information again later on. The book, What's Your Problem, is a very simple book. Can you tell us, uh, Thomas, where can we get the book? And is there a website we should know about? Uh, The website is called howtoreframe.com. And uh, there's a mailing list there you can sign up for as well. The book is on Amazon. It's uh, it's on Barnes and Nobles and, and so on. And most importantly, it's a, it's in your local booksellers. So get hold of those first. They can use the support at the moment. Okay. Uh, watch your problem. And it's published by Harvard Business Press. And it's just hearing Harvard makes it impressive that uh, the right people are listening to it and there's a lot of good ideas in there. Uh, Thomas, I love the examples throughout your book and I think that always rings a bell with us because we're going through these things, uh, whether it's a medical office, a law office, accounting, a restaurant, we all have problems. Uh, you talk about a group called, um, I think, Bark Box and Bark Buddy. Could you tell us what those are about? Well, that's a uh, startup that's based here in New York, and they sell uh, basically subscription boxes with stuff for your dog. Uh, what, the reason I, I share that story is because they took a look at a specific problem that's prevalent in the, uh, the adoption world, um, meaning if you look at shelters uh, for dogs in the U.S., uh, we have a surplus of dogs. Like every year, more than a million dogs end up in a shelter, and maybe half of those manage to get adopted through what, whatever the shelters are doing to get the word out there. Um, now, the team didn't have a lot of money, uh, so they started looking for a creative way to see that and started applying reframing to it. And they noticed that most people, you know, if, if you're looking at the challenge of getting somebody to adopt a dog from a shelter instead of buying it from a pet store, most people focus on the motivation. And so you'll see tons of advertising around, you know, there's a sad looking dog. Can you please help it? Uh, whatever it is. What the back box team recognized was that there's another part of the problem that was more unsolved. And that was the problem of access. It's actually, if you're looking to adopt a dog, you want to see it. And it's actually not that easy to uh, figure out where the dogs are or how to find them. Like shelters don't have a lot of money. And so they're typically not based on Main Street. They're, they're a bit outside of town or whatever. And so their solution was very elegant to, to the access problem. They created basically a dating app for dogs, like Tinder for dogs, where you could go in and see the, the adoptable dogs in your area in a very, very simple manner. And that was, I think they spent maybe $8,000 on it. Uh, and that got featured on Jimmy Kimmel Live, on in various news stations, and, and created a massive interest in, in, in dog adoption. And it, how perfect, I'm just looking at that, relatively inexpensive. I'm sure they want to move the dogs through. And if we look at pictures of dogs, how can we not fall in love with at least one or two of them as we're looking through, whether it's like a dog we had or a puppy or an older dog that needs a friend? We all just want that companionship. So I, I love that those ideas and uh, kind of a dating website for dogs. I think that's just kind of a cool entree into it that uh, if they, someone asks me, where am I going tonight? I'm going to a dating website and then I <laughs> drop in for dogs. That's just perfect. <laughs> Now, I know from reading your book, you say there's two ways of reframing. I think, can you tell us about those? Well, it's really about the recognition that what people tend to do when they look for new angles on a problem is to delve deeper into the first frame. So take the elevator example we spoke about earlier. If there's a slow elevator, people tend to say, why is the elevator slow? And then they try to like look for something in there that, that might be addressable. Now, that's all well and good, but the most powerful way to do this tends to be doing what I call breaking the frame. And breaking the frame is about resisting that urge to jump in and analyze the problem that's put before you, and instead try to take a step back and say, is there something else going on here? Is there a, another angle on this problem that has nothing to do with the speed of the elevator? 
Is this about the landlord that they they hate the landlord and now they're complaining about something else? Is it a, an attempt to renegotiate the rent? Uh, is it about our contracts that are not strong enough uh, and and so on? So that that core skill I find that's probably the key to really succeeding with reframing to have that ability to not jump in straight away but look for other ways of framing the problem. Now, I think you actually mentioned there's, there's five reasons to enjoy this approach. So can you tell us if you, at least a few of those? Well, I mean, evidently, you're going to avoid solving wrong problems. You know, but the ability to question problems means that you'll sometimes catch when you are uh, pointed in the wrong direction or bark- barking up the wrong tree. The elevator example also shows that sometimes you can find really smart solutions. Maybe you could fix a slow elevator by buying a new elevator, but putting up a mirror in the elevator hallway, that's a much, much smarter and cheaper way of solving it. Uh, And interestingly enough, I'd I'd say as well, you're actually going to make better decisions uh, because of this. There's a a professor called Paul Knott who studied decision-making. And he found that one of the best things you can do is to generate multiple options to choose from. So, you know, if you're facing a choice like, should I do an MBA or not? Or should I invest in this project or not? You're better off if you broaden the scope and say, well, should I pursue an MBA? Or should I do a startup? Or should I seek a new job? Or should I stay in my current role? Like creating multiple options for yourself means that you'll make much better decisions according to his research. And crucially, that's where reframing cr- comes in because those options have to be different. Like, if take the slow elevator example. There are some people who don't understand reframing and they will come up with a very great analysis of the 15 different providers of faster elevators. And they think they've done a great job in their analysis. Evidently, they haven't. They need to think outside the box, if you will, and, and find other alternatives to put on the table. Now, Thomas, when you run a seminar and you're, again, at the highest level of businesses, are there certain problems that keep coming up time and time again? Do people come to you and say, uh, I'm talking about in the practice, perhaps workshops Mm -hmm. and how to develop this technique. Uh, Is it they want a higher paying job or they want to uh, finish their day's work by 3.30 to go home early or just so that they don't have to work till midnight? Uh, Certain problems keep coming up again and again. Uh, people problems. I, I think consistently, if, if you're looking at what top level leaders are kind of struggling with, it all comes down to uh, it coexisting and co- collaborating with other people. Like it, it, it's, it's not so much the going home at three o'clock and so on. Sure, we all have problems like that. But what they really struggle with is an uncooperative colleague or, uh, you know, a group of uh, their team that's kind of heading in the wrong direction. They don't know how to fix it. Uh, One really powerful example I saw, uh, there's a company that had, you know, they, they knew that they were, their people weren't being very innovative or creative in the business. And so they identified a training program that would fix that. And they were planning how to roll it out. Now, as they're having a meeting about it in that management team, uh, the personal assistant uh, of, of, of the boss, a, a, a woman called Charlotte, interrupts them and says, folks, I've been here for 12 years. I've seen three prior management teams try to roll out some kind of innovation training, and they all failed. I don't think that's your problem. And to the team's credit, they listened to that and they recognized that people actually didn't need any training in innovation. They had all they needed on that front. What they needed was motivation. They, the, as they started talking to their people, they realized that most people had the sense that the leadership team didn't really care about them so much. And so evidently, they didn't bring any extra effort to work in trying to come up with, with new ideas and so on. And once the team realized that, they shifted completely on a dime. They threw away the innovation training, and they just focused on making their, uh, their workplace a better place to work. And they got fantastic results out of that, both both on a business level and also they became uh, their country's best place to work a few years later. So a really like potent example of how we often get people wrong. Uh, and that's not just true for top level leaders. I think that goes generally. Thomas, once again, I'd like to let our audience know if you're just tuning in. Our guest today is Thomas Whittle- Whittlesburg. 
He is the author of What's Your Problem? You're listening to Thomas on The Secrets of Success, 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College. And we're learning how to solve problems and actually uh, maybe reframe them and make the life, our life a lot easier. Thomas, can you tell us where can we get the book, What's Your Problem? And is there a website where we can learn more? The book is on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and on, in your local booksellers who might need some support at the moment. And uh, there's a website, howtoreframe.com, which also has some free resources you can check out. And as I t- told Thomas before the show, as soon as I picked up this book, I put a note on the front, love the book. This is one of those books that's perfect for our show and also perfect for our listeners you come up with one suggestion that's going to make life easier, more productive, or bring in more revenue, and you're right on that fast track in your business or looking to other businesses to uh, trade off your career and grow, grow, grow. Uh, Easy book to read, lots of fun ideas, and it also gets you into a new mindset. And Thomas, that's my next question. When people read your book, do you find they start thinking outside of the box and reframing more often and then but by that very process coming up with ideas yeah it, it's it is exactly that it's a new mindset in a way and i found the people people i've taught it to or who read the book they feel like they've been giving a given a new way of thinking uh it's it's really like when you think about it Every day we face various types of problems, whether at work or at home and so on. And this is just a very powerful lens with which to approach problems. So instead of jumping into solutions, you start developing that habit of saying, wait a second, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And is there another way of looking at that? Is there something about the problem we are not getting or we need to rethink? And I found as I'm preparing for this show, every little problem that I'm coming across I'm trying to put myself in your mindset and saying, how can I reframe it? How can I look at it differently? And it certainly doesn't hurt. Even if we only solve one out of 10 or seven out of 10, we're still doing a great job and we're getting a solution to at least a few of our problems. Thomas, is, do you recommend to people to do this by themselves or do you get them into groups of one, three, five, 20? What's the best way to reframe problems? You can start for yourself uh, almost as preparation, but the most powerful way to do it is to get at least two other people and share the problem, your problem with them and ask them to challenge your thinking. Uh, it, it's really a shortcut to new perspective because evidently we're sometimes too close to our own problems to see them clearly. I, a beautiful example of that. Um, I, in the book, I tell a story of a senior executive who is, uh, is in the auto industry and he loves his job, but he hates his boss. It's, it's just a very difficult relationship to, the, to this person. And he decides to quit. He wants to get away from him. So he approaches a headhunter. He asks and the headhunter says, well, that should not be a problem. Lots of great demand in the industry right now. I can very easily find you a similar job in a different company. Now, that same evening, the, uh, the, the leader, he goes back and he talks to his wife and he, turn, he, he discusses the problem with her and asks her, gets her help in trying to rethink it. And together they arrive at a, at a more interesting solution, namely the next day, the leader goes back to the headhunter and he hands him his boss's CV and says, can you find a job for this guy? <laughs> and, and, and it turns out the headhunter could. So the, the boss ends up accepting a different job through that process, not having no clue what what's going on. And the leader ends up getting his boss's own job. So, so a very, very memorable story and very simple illustration of the idea that if you have a problem, one of the best things you can do is discuss it with one or two other people. I think you just sold an extra 50% of those books because people hearing that are saying, wait, I can get rid of my boss and a promotion at the same time. This is definitely a win-win. They're going to want to learn how to reframe and to solve their problems. Now, Thomas, how about uh, insiders versus outsiders? If we're in a business, for instance, you mentioned doctors and medicine. Is it good to keep the solution in-house or uh, should we go out and get maybe a lawyer, a gas station attendant, and an accountant to help out? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, uh, I, I have the general rule of thumb that the more important the problem it is to solve, the more effort you need to invest in getting outside perspectives on it. 
And now I can tell you that the, the gas station attendant uh, or the lawyer, they may not be capable of solving your problem if it's not something they are expert, experts in. But they can often ask a question that makes you rethink what's really going on. Uh, example I saw here in, um, this was a team of leaders I work with in Brazil, of all places. And what happened was essentially uh, they had been given the job of their CEO to find a way of improving the, uh, the company's perception in the stock market. Uh, and so the, the group, they were all finance people, of course. They sat down. They did a very beautiful analysis of all the things that affect a company's stock price. And they were going nowhere. What changed happened because there was somebody in the room who was not a finance expert. Uh, it was an HR person. And she asked, wait a second. When external financial analysts call our company for information because they're, they're kind of writing an article about us, who do they talk to? And it turned out that those analysts were always directed to somebody more junior who had not received training in how to talk to analysts. So very simple outside perspective from somebody who was not a finance person could actually go in and solve the problem here exactly because they weren't blinded by, by the finance angle on the problem, if you will. And what type of time frame should we be looking at? I guess we think that if it's a million dollar problem, it must take three months. But is that realistic? Or maybe depending on the business, at least a week, or maybe for another business, a million dollar problem is like five years worth of revenue. Maybe it should take six months. Is there a time frame we should be looking at? Is there an urgency we should uh, factor in? I, I feel that this is almost always dictated by the situation you're in. So And so it's not actually a question of saying how much time should we spend on analysis up front. It is more a question of changing your way of working so you do this throughout the process. So instead of saying, okay, we're going to go off half a year into the mountains and sit and think deep thoughts, which almost never can never happen, uh, <laughs> you... you you actually have to develop the habit of doing this in, uh, and, and I, I actually teach people to do this in five minutes. Uh, bigger problems, you may need longer, but it's not a matter of getting off into the mountains. It's a matter of developing this like a five minute practice, or maybe it's half an hour for a bigger problem, and then doing that recurringly as you, go, as you work through a difficult situation. You, you might start with a round of reframing on Monday, then you work all week uh, trying to move forward. And then next Monday, you step back and say, wait, what did we learn last week? Do we need to rethink the nature of the problem here? That, that's really the key to making it work and making it applicable to all problems. Thomas, once again, I want our audience to know the book is Watch Your Problem. It's by our guest, Thomas Whittle, Whittleberg. And that last name is spelled W-E-D-E-L hyphen W-E-D-E-L-L-S-B-O-R-G. Thomas, where can we get the book and the website we should look to? The website, howtoreframe.com. There's some free resources there. And the book is available wherever you buy books. Uh, normally, they're online. They're on Harvard's website. They are Amazon. Uh, and you can ask your local book dealers as well. And I think you mentioned before, this is put out by the Harvard Business Review Press, correct? Yes, it is. Beautiful. Thomas, thanks so much. We're going to be practicing what you've taught us today. And I'm sure many of us are going to be getting a copy of that book and uh, jumping right up that corporate ladder. Thanks so much for being with us on this week's edition of The Secrets of Success. Thanks so much, Bill. I'd like to thank our guest today, Thomas Whittlesborg. His book is Watch Your Problem. You've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Loran, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.